Just back from stop number six of the Bassmaster Elite Series, and you know what it is. It's the week after Elite Series event. So once again, it's Jake's take and our Pickwick recap. This week on... I'm Bob Cobb from the Bassmaster. Welcome to Mercer. Another week, another podcast. Happy Wednesday, happy hump day. You are halfway through the week, and you will always find us here at Hump Day, the awkwardly honest fishing podcast that goes by my last name, which is Mercer. I'm Dave Mercer. Welcome to our little show. And um, this week, we're going behind the scenes again with the ultimate Jake's take. One of my favorite segments that we do on any show, and I know you guys love it too. And uh, this one extra special because Jake uh, might come in here smelling all of whiskey and concert smoke because he was just at a Whiskey Myers concert, not just any Whiskey Myers, but a Whiskey Myers concert at Red Rocks, which is hallowed halls when it comes to performing places. It's somewhere that, um, oh, I've always wanted to go and I'm so freaking jealous so without further ado thank you for watching make sure you like subscribe and all that stuff let's jump into it and let's bring in the tenderness jake latondras yeah that's what latondras means the tenderness straight out of pickwick and some of us had a pit stop on on the way back from pickwick <laughs> jake latondras where, where where are you coming from Dude, I had an amazing night last night at so the, the Shrine of Rock and Roll Red Rocks Amphitheater in Morrison, Colorado, and so fortunate to have a connection through Lee Livesey, as everyone knows, is sponsored by Whiskey Myers, and I mean, they rocked the house just like we all thought they would, and we missed you. I thought about you all night. I thought about Lee all night, and... I, well, I missed you guys, but it was, oh. it was a blast. <laughs> I wanted to be there so bad. I want, I mean, and the, you sent me that video when they played, that's ex the exact reaction I expected it to be when they played stone in that cathedral. Like, you know what I mean? It's just freaking, I don't even know what it would feel like to be there because when you just look at it, it, it has a feeling, you know what I mean? Like it, it's, Almost like hallowed grounds, I guess. You know, I mean, like you a, have to walk up to it like like you're walking up the Aztec pyramids or <laughs> the Egyptian pyramids or something. It has this very religious experience about it. And I mean, they ha they hold church ceremonies there on Sundays when there's nothing going on. It's it's that kind of a place. Wow. And you know, when the lights go down, there's usually some kind of a storm off in the distance where there's lightning. There was a rainbow that a half rainbow behind the stage that lasted for like an hour, it like it didn't go away. It was unbelievable, man. And, and you know, I, you sent me that text and said, shoot me some video of stone when they play it. And of course, when they started, they started the song, everyone lit their light, their led lights up on their phone and held it up. Like we used to hold, big lighters up right yeah. and so I, I i turned my my phone around as a camera and shot it and was like wow this is this is amazing and i was thinking about you the entire time by far the best um cell phone video i've ever received from a buddy <laughs> at a concert normally they're like all well, shaky and you hear them yelling or whatever but it was it was very well shot and uh the baddest ass band especially when it comes to the fishing industry whiskey myers Rocked it, obviously. And it was cool to see the videos and pictures just because I knew how excited they, like when we went to see them, we were in Chattanooga, they were talking about that show. And, to, you know, it's cool to see that. So I know, I'm new goal. We need a Bassmaster Classic way in Red Rocks. How do we make that happen? Oh, Could you imagine? Goodness. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> oh, is it what? What is there anything close to there, fishable, like that you could have a bass tournament in or no? Not for Bassmaster, not at that, oh. not at, not at the elite level. They have lots of local bass, like Bassmaster Denver Club, and they do have. They actually have a bigger bass fishing contingency here than people realize, just because it's Colorado. We're not we're people think of trout and walleyes, right? Yeah. But there's actually a a pretty 
People think of other things when it comes to Colorado, too. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I could smell it at Red Rocks last night. (laughs) Oh, I meant the Denver Broncos, who evidently just got bought by Walmart. How weird is that? So they're they're talking about building a new football stadium, which we just got a new one a few years ago. But they're saying that the NFL and the new owners of the Denver Broncos have agreed if they build a new stadium with a retractable roof, they'll bring the Super Bowl to Denver. How cool would that be? Wow. You come out, you can stay at my house. Oh, I'm all in, all in, (laughs) just like I was for the Red Rock show. (laughs) But we'll make it happen this time. Uh, John Elway lost $900 million dollars over that deal did you see that story no really at some point like he's obviously got a good relationship with them he's their gm or director of football operations whatever his title is but at some point they offered him rather than this pay we offer you this percentage of ownership and he took the pay and now that walmart bought it it would have worked out to almost a billion dollars 900 million dollars for whatever little percentage he was going to own so wow there's a nugget (laughs) <laughs> yeah, yeah. If you had a fine life, anyways, John Elway. Um. Yeah, I, I would say this about the Whiskey Myers show too: that I would say eighty percent of that crowd was from Texas. Like, really? I'm telling you, everybody there was from Texas. Like, we were in the VIP section, and everyone that was sitting by us was obviously from Texas because they were either friends or family of either Whiskey Myers or the two opening bands. Yeah. But then I went out, and mingled in the crowd a little bit, and just started talking to people. Man of the people. And, Dude, everybody there was from Texas. I'm like, hell yeah. <laughs> bring it. Bring it, Texas. Bad day to be a bush light. Oh, it was a it was a bad day to be a bush light last night. I had a few myself. <laughs> you you have what what is it like 64? Um what is it? What, what who'd you go to see? Oh, um Oh, the Who's Grateful it? Dead. Grateful Dead. How many times? 64? 64 times. I've seen widespread <laughs> panic probably as many, if not more times. You know, I've seen the Stones, ACDC, Jethro Tull, Guns N' Roses. I used to be a, I have a stack, I have a stack of, of old uh, ticket stubs from all the concerts I've been to that are that thick. I used to be a huge music head. So getting to see Whiskey Myers, VIP, at Red Rocks, which I've been to Red Rocks many, many times, but that was really special. And I did talk to Lee this morning. He was just checking in to see how it went. And, and uh, thank you, Lee. That was that was incredible. That was a great experience. Where where does their show rank? I mean, you've seen a lot of shows. Where, where's Whiskey Myers for you? Man, this is going to sound like a sales pitch, but it's pretty high up there, man. I mean, they bring they – bring, yeah. They bring the house down. When they jam, they jam, and then they can slow it down. Their ballads are incredible. Stone is like this religious experience. Yeah. I mean, that's a – I was talking to the two friends I went with last night and said, this is one of the best shows I've ever seen at Red Rocks. I mean, it was – It was badass. (laughs) Most shows you go to, and I felt the same when we saw him. And I didn't see him at Red Rocks. I still don't know the place's name that I saw them. That's how bizarre (laughs) that whole experience was. But um, after I saw them, uh, I literally, like a lot of shows, most shows you go to really, you're like, yeah, he's not quite what I was expecting. I mean, it's hard to be as good as a polished, finished, but live there you go to see whiskey myers you'll like them you'll like them more after you see them live exactly it's, a, it's like an old school rock slash leonard skit like it's nuts it's a, it's a whole experience it, it's a show and let me say this i'll put them on the level i've seen the allman brothers like six or seven times and it's that good the sound the tight oh, yeah. the tight knit music that they play and and everything about it is is very Almond Brothers, you know, Almond Brotherish. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, if you haven't already, go see Whiskey Myers because uh, this first segment was brought to you by the baddest ass band in uh, in pro That's fishing. Sure. I will say. I mean, uh, you know, say what you want, but they they're the, you know Zach Brown had their time. They played the classic, and uh, Whiskey Myers has taken over, um, and it, and so they should. Um, let's get to Pickwick. Let's talk about bass fishing. I missed the first two days, so I have nothing to report on the first two days other than, uh, why I missed the first two days. I mean, it really wasn't a, uh, 
big uh, controversy, but like many, many people, guess what? I got COVID again. Um, so I kicked its ass one more time. Um, but there was a restriction where you can't fly till 10 days after a positive test. So uh, thus, I arrived on Friday. That was my 10 days. So I missed the first couple of days, but it was sweltering hot. And Chris Bowes lives in Florida and um, I live in it. Canada. So, uh, I mean, it didn't work out that bad, really. But um, I hate it. Hey, it I hated hot. missing it. I hate missing events. Like it sucks when you. I mean, it's a lot worse when you don't go at all, like the ones I missed last year. But to miss a few days, it does like you're like, wow, we're we're so on the inside. You know what I mean? It's weird to be on the outside. It just kind of sucks. I know you don't like this part of it either. Mercer, but we missed you. And there were a lot of people talking about it. Not and not to, you know, belittle anyone else that covers for you while you're gone, but all I heard during weigh-ins and even at takeoff was, dang man, we miss Mercer. And then people start talking about all the 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 things that you have to remember to rattle these things off about every angler. So we miss you, Mercer. We love yeah. you, buddy. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I, 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 it was better than if people were like, oh, I didn't even know you weren't here. What you, you missed it. We didn't even notice. Um, well, as we've talked about before, we're one big family, right? I mean, it is truly this, this entourage, but it's a family of people and yeah. we're all used to our positions and where everyone is supposed to be, the sounds, the sights, and the, you know, the environment that we build at, uh, Bass, at Bassmaster Elite events. And, you know, that's a big part of it, the sound. So anyhow, well, I'm glad you. you're back. Yeah. And don't Oops, do that again. again. Yeah. I'll try not to. I, I was told I could not get it. There was no possible way. Well, that person was a liar <laughs> because evidently I did. And speaking of that family of bass, dude, that's one thing that stood out to me. The fork event and this event. Our crew is really getting their vibe. You know what I mean? Like as far as you watch those two weigh-ins, you know, and I'll just single out the Sunday weigh-ins specifically, but like just the fun that their anglers are like the, everybody knows what happened at Fork and how crazy that was. And just watching Matt Roberts kind of trash talk, Justin Atkins on the stage and how much <laughs> fun you're hearing between the, it's, it's cool to see. The tadpoles have grown up and then they're swimming on their own and they are, uh, it, it's, it's awesome to see. I mean, that's, and when you realize what our guys went through, dude, like they just got to the point where, Hey, we're, we're getting comfortable with this. Then COVID comes along. They don't get, you know, they got to be on the other side of the stage on a microphone. It's just, so it's cool to see what's happening with the elite series. So kudos to all the anglers. And if you're one of the boring ones, smart enough. <laughs> Yeah, not, so none of them are boring. They're all just different. You know what I mean? Like there's everybody. I, I, we keep talking, you know, we keep saying this too. the characters of the Bassmaster Elite Series are really coming out now. Yeah. People are having babies. People are getting married. Like yeah. it's a real, this is like, this is pretty cool. I mean, it's a, it's a, you know, it was, it's part of the pivotal point that occurred a few years ago at Bassmaster. And now we're really feeling that family aspect. I mean, how much more family can you get than, you know, watching people have kids and people getting married and, and all that yeah. stuff. It's just, just really, we share those experiences with each other. Right. Yeah. And, and this week's champion, I mean, you said family and you don't have to go any further than like, like I honestly, that was a Brandon Lester win, but but his family is so supportive, and it's, it's just such an awesome story. I mean, his mom's married to Clay Dyer, just in that alone, like that, and, a, and Clay and his passion, but like in a world where, and maybe I shouldn't even say this, but like that's also why people tune in here because we try to be real, but in a world where divorced couples and people that aren't together anymore use kids as leverage, you look and you're like, there's Brandon's dad and he's with Clay and his mom. And I mean, he's helping Clay in different situations when he needs, when he'll take help. And it's just freaking cool to see a family win together, like truly a good, it's an amazing, amazing story. It's a, and to see Clay on the stage, you know, it's Brandon's win, all Brandon's and he deserves it. And he worked his, you know, what off for a long time. 
um, and has been so close. But man, it, it, it was it was a family win and it, you didn't have to look any further. That, that's why on Sunday I, did, I posted a picture of his whole family because that's what kept screaming to me. You know what I mean? Like him and Kim have been together. You know, they got together in high school. You know what I mean? Right. Like it, it's and then through things, they both ended up with different people. But that's who they were supposed to be in their back. You know, it's just it's cool. It's like a life story. So back, or here's a little nugget backstory during the event while you, you weren't there, but one of my friends from my hometown, I grew up about an hour and a half north of Pickwick on okay, Kentucky yeah. Lake. Yeah. And that's when they go meet the friends and then get the poops. Yeah. <laughs> and one of my friends, uh, David Ross, who I've known for many, many years, he was, he is married to a childhood, female childhood friend of mine that I grew up with. His dad was my, one of my duck hunting mentors, a legend in the area as a duck hunter, all those things. He comes down and he's a marshal. Okay. And he says, Hey man, I'm staying at my friend's house. This guy's a, you know, he's an entertainer. He likes to have, have, he likes to host dinner parties and stuff. So come on over. He's going to cook you guys a steak and blah, blah, blah. So I show up and crack a bush light. And, uh, it's, this is the afternoon of day after day one, John Cox and Brandon Lester are both staying at this house as guests of his. So we all ate dinner two nights in a row together. And I've never been in the boat with Brandon Lester and really, really? Didn't know. I mean, no, we've, we've bumped knuckles at the dog. So before. shocking. Yeah, but we've never we've never uh, worked together, and so I had the opportunity on day one and day two in the evenings to spend time with him, have a beer or two, have a steak, have some barbecue, sit down and talk about family, you know, his gear, what's going on at the on the lake, and all yeah. that stuff. And it was really cool. And one of the really cool things was how how different John Cox. And Brandon Lester were fishing and always do fish and how well both of them did in co two completely different scenarios at Pickwick. Yeah. Yeah. And it, I mean, Lester fished the way everybody expected and Cox did what Cox they wants to do. <laughs> um, but Brandon Polnick still leads the angler of the year. And also what a freaking like, as if his life isn't a Hollywood story as much as it already is, but like, I'm leaving the event and I'm going to drive home 31 hours to have a baby. And I hope he got <laughs> home safe and all, all went well. We'll update that in future episodes. Um, but I mean, the whole, everything happening in the elite series is, is freaking kind of cool right now. It's a, it's a neat place to be. And I'm really honored and proud to be there right now. Cause this is, this is the, like the, the blossoming, like this is where things go when things are going well and it's a really cool thing to be a part of. I'm, I'm yeah. just proud to be there, man, for sure. So day one, you were with Dalla Bill, defending champion Bill Lowen, correct? Bill Lowen. Yes, it was very hot. Um, it was a grind. And, you know, Bill, the one thing I'll say about that day, and it's so far back, it's hard for me to remember <laughs> all these things like we've talked about. But the one thing that I do recall about that day was, Bill getting discouraged during the day because it was such a grind. And literally in the last hour, he freaking, he pulled up to this, this lay down and started flipping it and started. And, and, and what he thought was supposed to happen on day one started happening at one thirty in the afternoon. And he salvaged today. He only had like one or two fish in the live well. And he pulled up to this tree and he literally caught 20 bass and 20 casts. And filled hmm. his live well up. You know, he ended up with 12 or 13 pounds, which was about middle of the pack, a little maybe 50th or so. Um, and he salvaged his day. So there was, you know, there was some encouragement there. And and uh, I always enjoy being in the boat with Bill Lowen. What a, yeah. what a nice guy that guy is. He really is. He really is. Great dude. So, Speaking of family. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So obviously you're not with him on day two. You That's when you – Hook your Jason bumper Christie. to. Oh, Jason Christie. That's right. I went from, from one Hulk express Hulk. boat to the next. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Clay Connors will be happy with you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So Jason had, he caught like 22 pounds. And uh, the first day, 22, six, I think it were 22, four, 22, six, whatever. The first day was in second place when we went out on day two. 
And, you know, one of the problems with Pickwick and the way it sets up, especially when there's no current, is, you know, as, as big as some people might think Pickwick is, that place fish is very small. And all these community holes draw a crowd from locals to other pros and the pros are sharing space. Uh, there's locals out there that are fishing. There are guides that are fishing. I mean, it gets pretty small pretty fast. Yeah. Um, and Jason, you know, he told me before we left, we went out and just floated uh, while we were waiting on takeoff. And he told me um, while we're sitting there waiting for, for him to go out was that he said, dude, I got, I, I'm not going to, I'm not going to lie. I got lucky the first day I caught fish bigger than I thought I was going to catch. So in all likelihood, I'm probably going to go out and catch 12 to 14 pounds today unless I get lucky again. And that's what he ended up doing. And some people say that, I mean, that's just being realistic. You know what I mean? Yeah. It, like there's plenty of people that will like believe their own. He knows what he got. Um, a cool thing about him that I saw happening, not, not at the event, but leading into the event that I think is when I saw it, I was like, that's really good for both of them. Um, you know, you see different elite series pros spending a little time in the water together at weeks in between events. I saw him and Gussie spend a bunch of time together. Not that Christy needs any help anywhere, but I'm like, Gussie can use some time with Christy. And and I think, honestly, Christy can use some time with Gussie just as far as, like, if you look at where they both excel, them spending time in the boat together uh, is only going to make them both better. I think it's cool. You see that more and more now on social media, like, like Swindle and Jockinson and Gussie, like these, I love seeing these guys get together and go fish for fun after tournaments on different lakes and they're sharing, you know, their skills together. And I, I just think it's great. And again, it's all, it all, it's all rolled up into that, that new family atmosphere that Bassmaster has and, and I think that's a big part of it. You know, they're, they're all trust is being gained amongst, uh, anglers, you know, becoming better friends with each other yeah. and all that stuff. I, I, I think it's just, it's great. And don't worry, it's all going to get shattered in the next three events. <laughs> exactly. <because> people are <laughs> going to be cut and it's the end of the season and <clears throat> the pirates come out. It's always the end of the year. I mean, it's, it's like anything, like, you know what I mean? It's it, watch a marathon. It, it's not that exciting, but the last hundred yards you never know what's going to happen so that'll that's, be the, that's the part that people you know the, the viewers or the fans out there that don't see or experience which we can try to share with them but you know they don't see like we make friends with all these people too or they're all com comrades and friends and then you know we have to lose what 13 or 14 or 15 people at the end of the season and it's it's you know it's like Wow. <laughs> and you look at the names this year, you know what I mean? Like the, it, it's, and every year it's going to get tougher. You know what I mean? There's this weird thing and it may be have spread by Randy Blockett because I mean, and I love, love Randy Blockett. I love having him on the podcast and, and I love somebody who's stuck to their beliefs, but he's kind of floated out that it's almost impossible to qualify for the elite series, but it's also almost impossible to get eliminated from the elite series. The first part, I will agree, it is incredibly hard to get in the Elite Series. The second part, you are totally wrong. I mean, when you look at the names that are facing a cut right now, and it's not my business to put those names out there, they know who they are, but they've won Elite, some of them. They've made classics, multiple classics, and I'm not talking about in the past. I'm talking in the last few years, and they could still be facing elimination. So it's anything, anything but... Um, <laughs> but it's easy to stay in the elite series now. I mean, I think, you know, I think it's like any professional sport and Brandon Fiend, you know, uh, one of our camera guys, we were talking about this on the way to the airport uh, in Memphis. Uh, was that yesterday already? Yeah. yeah. Yesterday. Um, it's, you know, Bassmaster Elite is these guys, this is like, this is the NFL or Major League Baseball. This is the big leagues, right? And it sh should you agree that it should be that difficult to get into the elites coming through the farm system that they have to go through to get there because these are the best bass anglers in the world. And, you know, 
go go do it. If you're if you're if you want to be the best in the world, go get into the elites. It's not impossible because we get new rookies every single year. It's yeah. very very difficult, but it's not impossible. Two two of them were in the top ten this week. You were with one of them, Cody Huff and Jacob Fouch. Look at those dudes. They qualified through the opens. Um, prime example of just how incredible the college bass deal is. But um, it it's not impossible. I get it. It is very hard. But the the last thing that anybody, any spectator, if you really look, and if you, did, I'm telling you, I'm not just saying this. It's anything but easy to stay on the Bassmaster Elite Series. When you see this list, so, of it, it's so freaking hard, really. Like, and, and halfway through the season, if a big time angler is struggling, they start feeling the pressure. I mean, we've yeah. talked, we've both talked to several, many of them, you know, halfway through a season where they're struggling, and it's like, man. Speaking of which, how about Chris Zaldane? He's having a great year. And Dude, it's, I, it, but I love it. I think this was his first top 10, though. Like, you know, nobody's seen. He's got that, you know, that quiet, great year. Like he's in the top 10 for Angler of the Year now and, and going to three fisheries that you would expect Zaldane to catch him on. Um, yeah. So it was cool to see him in the top 10. Definitely. There's something that hit me during uh, weigh-ins on Sunday that you said was what you uh, touched on a minute ago and how important and how um, how advancing the college Bassmaster series is becoming to this whole scene. And those guys, dude, I mean, I fished with several of them, even out here in Colorado or people I know at Bethel, they're freaking good at what they do. Oh. And, and the technology obviously has helped them. And these kids grew up in the video video game day and age and they're really really good at this whole live scope thing really yeah. good at it and i don't think it's just live scope like people will write them off and say oh well technology they're young of course they're they're going to be about that and and they are they are about that but i think kj queen it, it made the most sense to me the way he explained it and he really simplified it and i think it was so simple that a lot of people will be like they don't stop and really think about it but he's like Every angler that goes at a collegiate level and even pro anglers, whatever you want to say, everybody has three, four techniques that you, you feel like if they're biting this way, look out. Nobody's going to stop me. I know what I'm doing. I have ultimate confidence in this type of fishing. And some of them, it's more, but I'm saying at least every one of them has three. But the difference is when you go to the elite series, they don't sit there and show the other competitors. So you put them in a collegiate environment and like at Bethel, he told me that the coach would pair them up specifically where he's like, okay, you're from the South. You're from the North. You guys should be together. So just think about it. And I, I was explaining to Davey on the weekend. I'm like, so imagine if a 20 year old Davey height meets a 20 year old Mark Zona and you're both trying to fish tournaments and you have all of that stuff from down South. But when you met Mark, he might've fished with you and you guys might've shared some stuff, but you weren't that open book that you are like when you're working as a team and you literally learn about tube fishing or drop shot fishing or whatever it is from that person, but their confidence, their experience, the way they work it, it all passes into you. So then you end up with a group of guys that all came in. There were three techniques, but now those three techniques are nine techniques or 12 techniques and they're so complete I, and it, it's so simple, but if you really think about it, there's no other time in fishing that people, you know, a nine man team is going to be open with each other and tell them then that. And it gives you such an advantage because I would go as far to say you could be in the elite series for five years and you won't have nine, two or three pros that will show you nine different techniques and literally show you the way they're learning. You know what I mean? And, and correcting and practicing. So I mean, that makes total sense to me when you think about it. That's why they're so well-rounded in so many ways. I mean, you can see it in their fishing skills. Their their adaptability is uncanny at, at, at a young age, right? So yep. I'm in the boat with Cody Huff, and and one of his techniques starts to die off. There's no current. You know, he catches two or three fish, and then they become inactive. Well, then he repositions his boat picks up a different rod. He goes from a bait caster and a, you know, a deep diving crankbait to a drop shot and a spinning rig. 
And all of a sudden, he goes from catching largemouth in this school of fish to catching smallmouth in the same school of fish. And it's like, this is what you're talking about. It's that adaptability and having those different skills that they learned in college and they bring it to the elite level. And it is absolutely 100% factor. And it's really interesting to watch these young guys thrive in that world. It's, it's, yeah. pretty, it's really cool, actually. And they don't, they don't pick up that, you know, you'll hear other pros pick up a spinning rod and be like, oh, sissy rod or whatever. You can clearly tell they, tell they, that can, to fish Jason this, they can catch them <laughs> doing this, but that's not what they want to be doing. They're just being forced to do it. When you see the young guys switch, they're so quick. You know what I mean? And you're like, okay, he's just as adept at doing this. And, you know, I, I have several veteran pros this week tell me like they feel the sport is changing. They're like, man, it's there's so much pressure on these fish now because of electronics, because of the growth of the popularity of fishing that, man, you got to use this like that whole all old school. Like, you know, I don't use a spinning rod until we go up north. Like the, it, I'm talking serious, like Alabama born pros telling me, man, the sport is changing and I need to change with it. Um so yeah, it's a, there's a there's a lot happening now behind the scenes in the sport, but but the rookies, um, it's pretty incredible to see what what they're doing. Um, another guy I was happy to see in top ten uh, that that is the anomaly of the sport is one of the brightest young stars in this freaking sport, and he has had absolute nightmare Bassmaster Elite Series career really for his standards is Justin Atkins. I mean it, that dude. Former Forest Wood Cup champion, like the, you don't even have to go through his. I mean, he's won the opens. He qualified to be here, but he's just it just hasn't clicked for him. You know what I mean? And it feels like whenever it clicks, something happens or whatever. And uh, my prediction for him is that for the rest of the season, you're going to seem like he's going to catch him in the St. Lawrence River. He almost he was second there last time we were there. So I think he's going to have a strong tail end to the season and. Uh, I think he'll be fine for qualification and everything. I'm not exactly sure how that all works, but it's just say that to yourself that Justin Atkins, just if you think it's easy to say in the elite series, Justin Atkins has openly said, I am fighting for my fishing career. <laughs> so it's definitely not, definitely not easy. What do you think? What do you think it is about? I mean, we know how momentum carries power in, 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 success right mm -hmm. but but failure carries momentum the other direction and it can last for i mean a full season two seasons you know and 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 shatter dreams what do you think what do you think i mean we all know it's pressure but what do you think causes that downward momentum swing that that creates a rut that that's so difficult for them to get out of and okay i mean i think i I don't know that this is Justin. First of all, I would not. You know what I mean? Because you can't answer for somebody. No, but, no, no. But from I'm what talking I see about, from the outside, yeah, yeah. Over from years of seeing this, right? It's just you start second guessing yourself. You're the most effective in every single sport, and and even more so in fishing. When you just boom, boom, you just like you, it's not. I think they're on that point. It's they're on that point and you head to it like and I've used Aaron as the example. Uh, I was so lucky to be literally beside his boat for season long time you know, when he had his angler of the year runs and, and when he didn't have his angler of the year runs. And you would take the exact same angler that everybody knows is super talented and such a great thinker. And when Aaron had his angler of the year seasons, Aaron didn't ever think of anything. He's just like, Pump, go to that point and catch him. Once that's done, he's like, yeah, they're probably on those docks over there. Boom, goes. I've also seen the air and he, you know, just a year later where the season doesn't start as good. And then all of a sudden he's like, oh, you think they're on that point or oh, they're probably right. on the docks or maybe they're on the channel swing or and he, he's the exact same angler, but he starts second guessing himself. And I, the only reason I use Aaron as an example, because you, you can see how it's just momentum and it's thought, but it's the same thing. Um. It's funny because I, I've been having those thoughts about my own life lately, like really like sure. And, and trying to be more reactionary, like just one, the first thought you think, just do it. You know what I mean? Like, cause it's generally, 
I mean, if you've got a demented mind, it puts you in a lot of bad situations, <laughs> but uh, situations are situational. Um, so I, uh, but I, but I'll give you an example like this weekend in my own job on day three, Zona asked me on live. He said, does Brandon Lester have this or who do we have to watch? And in my head right away, for whatever reason, I thought Cody Huff, just because I talked to him that morning at takeoff, nothing he said, but I just weirdly, you just think Cody Huff. And I didn't say it and evidently regretted it for the rest of the week because I would have sounded like I know what I'm talking about. But I think that all things in life, really, your initial thought is generally the right thing. But once you start to dissect, you know, pick it apart and start to be like, well, no, they wouldn't be there now because of this or that, or I don't want to put pressure on Cody Huff or I don't want, you know what I mean? Like it, you start, it's usually the wrong decision. And I think that that is the biggest difference. That's what momentum is. It's, it's not second guessing yourself. It's knowing that you're making the right move and also having the nuts to be like, if it's not the right move. It's also the move that's going to lead me to the right move. I think that's what you're seeing with Paul Nick right now. I think that's what you see every single day with Cox. He, I mean, he does I was not. just going to bring him up. Yeah. Yeah. And the, like, and, and the thing is they keep it simple too, right? Remember fighter last year talking about, he went back to, to, to basic simple bass fishing yeah. and he stopped, you know, wondering what, I, I guess it's, it gets complicated when you're like, you have so many options to throw out there. If you just keep it simple and go on your instinct, then all of a sudden things start to play out in your favor again. Right. Cause you're just fit. I mean, they say it all the time. I'm just going to go fishing. Yeah. But, but do they, you know what I mean? Like if there's Sometimes some that say don't. that and, mm -hmm. and you have to understand it's eight hours worth of those decisions. It's not just a split second decision. Do I swing or do I not swing? You know what I mean? You're not just hitting a ball. It's eight hours worth of those decisions and they all add up. And that's also why I think you see, Take Chris Grohl, for example, at her last event last year, makes a top 10. That was awesome. You see sometimes guys that are about to be eliminated go on this run in their final few events, but it's because all of a sudden, again, I have the ultimate respect for all those guys. This is not throwing shade on anybody. This is being sure. realistic with what they deal with, and, and that's why I have so much respect for them. But I think why you see so many anglers going to run when it's about to run out is because they're not – thinking they anymore the they're like there's well, well they're just like man a 50th doesn't do crap for me right. but but there's a lot of them that after one bad season because it only takes two years you go into the next year and you start thinking man I, I listen i i'll win the ones i can and get top tens where i can but i just gotta make sure not to burn in any of them i can't get any 90s i'll get them all you know right around that cut line if i can stay in the cut once you start chasing that cut, I think, it, you know, like, and if it's going good, there's some guys who it's going great and they climb, but I just feel like that weight. And then one goes bad and you get a 90th and you're like, okay, I need all top 25s now. And you start putting that number. And uh, when anglers fish free, it, they're always, always better. Um, look at, but, look at the guys that qualify for the open or um, qualify for the classic through an open or something or, or whatever they do. And then all of a sudden, like they become scary anglers because they're fishing free, right? This is exactly yeah. what you're talking about. Jason Christie and I were sitting in the boat day two. We talked about this quite a bit, actually. And he was talking about how, how, um, oh God, I just lost my train of thought, Dave. Oh, this is so <laughs> embarrassing. It's the COVID <laughs> fog. Well, he was, oh my God. I've said it twice during this podcast. We're probably going to get flagged. <laughs> be a warning. <laughs> give me, can you give me a second? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Lo, should I just be silent or should I talk? Hey, I'll tell a story while you think of it. Here's a funny okay, story. Okay. You want to know how, because uh, this is one of the things, and I don't even know if you saw it or heard about it. It happened on Championship Sunday. So, and I noticed, you know what I mean? Because there's only 10 boats going out on Championship Sunday. And the venue we had, there was lots of room and it was, everything was right there. It was great. Um, so I, all the anglers were in the water and there was a camera boat in the water, you know, like it, the truck in the water. So takeoff happens, everybody goes. And I notice, and Chris Bowes notices and Lisa Talmadge notices, but it's just us standing there in over streets. That's really what it is. And a few straggler, you know, people that came down to watch. 
Um, and then they talk to us because the real people are gone. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's, it's magical time. Um, but we noticed this truck is sitting there and we're like the truck. And I go up to the truck and it's like backed in. It was a Phoenix boat. The trailer, you could tell it was backed in too far. So you could tell the person was real excited to go in the morning and windows wide, right down, tunes cranked, cell phone charging on it, running and like 30 rods in the passenger seat. And it's just sitting there and we're like, there's nobody else around. We're like, whose is this? It turned out it was um, it was Florida plates and it had a North Alabama sticker on it. So that'll help people listen to this put together who it might be. If you do know people that go to North Alabama, they're from Florida. They go to North Alabama. They were kind enough to work with Sego, one of our still photographers, the great Sego. But they were so excited or Sego is such a demanding employee or that they backed it in, left it running. Like that truck was in easy a half hour before takeoff. And they sat out there and never realized that their vehicle was running. So we ended up moving it. And it was like, wow. Chris Bose has done tournaments for over 20 years. Lisa's done tons of tournaments. You know, I've done a lot. We're all like, yeah, I've, I've seen people back their boat and truck, like literally right in the water, full qualified captain stuff. But I never seen somebody just like, check out. I'm going fishing. Just leave her running. <laughs> so, wow. yeah. Yeah, That's that was kind of weird. That was kind of weird. That's bizarre. I'm blaming it on Sego. Sego's a hard person to work for. We got <laughs> to go now. Kent is in the top ten. <laughs> he's having a he's having a, a yeah a good year as well. We we yeah. talked a lot about the, the Japanese anglers. I think I was talking to, I guess Wes, uh, uh, one day after day three. We we're talking about all the Japanese anglers that are you know in the elites and in the opens. And I think what's the what's the camera guy's name uh, that hangs out with Kenta? Um, oh, oh, why why don't you put me on a spot like this? Um, doesn't matter. Yeah, either way, we were talking about it. And he counted up. There's like 10, 10 Japanese anglers in the elite and open level right now. Oh yeah, no. it's 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 pretty impressive. I think we've talked about this before, haven't we? Yeah, no, it's it's uh, uh, international. You know, there's several Australians trying to make it. You know, there's a bunch of Canadians. We've already talked about Cooper Gallant a lot. You know what I mean? A lot of different. So, yeah, it's definitely becoming a very international sport. So um, did you remember what you were going to talk about? Or did, no, is, I, no. I, I, we, oh we get to talking about other things and I can't go back. I can't. I can't compartmentalize conversations like this. <laughs> All right. But it was it but it was important. It was it was something Jason and I were talking about how how was it the way they he, fished the classic? No. Oh. No. I I I can't I can't remember. I I will remember at some point, but right now I just can't compartmentalize that. All right. Well, that whole thing we were talking about too with the mental thing, I think that's why there is certain anglers that are better at winning classics and there's certain, and that's the thing you hear about anglers that you don't think like when they get to the classic, there's certain anglers that feel free. There's certain anglers that it tightens up, but there's certain anglers that are like, it doesn't matter whether I catch one bass or 25 pounds. It's the same difference. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, obviously, but 12 pounds ain't going to help you in this tournament. You don't need to conserve points. You don't need to make sure you finish middle of the pack. You go for the win. And if you burn the house down going for it, that's okay. It's better to do that than have, you know what I mean? Like there's a lot of guys who are like, I don't want to finish 15th in the Bassmaster Classic. That doesn't, uh, you know, that just means I fished all three days, but it doesn't get me any closer to the goal than some guys that, finish, that don't make the cut. Well, that was the that was now I remember what uh, so Jason yeah. and I were talking about. You you uh you teed it up there. He was talking about how you know he's his stubbornness and how and that can be such a pivotal point for an angler for an entire season based on a decision that person an angler makes at any given time in any tournament. It could swing their momentum either either in the plus or minus. Right. And, and what I mean by that, and this is part of the conversation that Jason and I were talking about is where he's stubborn. So he's like, man, you know, I'm stuck in one of my stubborn ruts right now and I'm just not going to change it. And I said, well, I mean, sometimes it's like in the classic, that's what won you the classic because you didn't deviate from your plan and you knew those fish were going to bite late. You just had to figure out where they were positioned, but you stuck to your game plan because of your stubbornness. And he said, 
That's right. So then we started talking about how, how that can change someone's career and either like it did Jason's or if you, if you, if you stay stubborn and you don't deviate from your plan and make the right adjustment and you make a decision that sends you downward in a downward spiral, that can take you into that abyss that we were talking about earlier where that, that negative momentum is sometimes unrecoverable. And, yeah. and, and so that again brought up this topic of there are different ways for these anglers to make a living as professional anglers in this sport, right? Some of them do play to cash checks. Some of them play to win. And, and there's two different strategies to all that. So that was a really interesting conversation that I had with Jason Christie that kind of, you know, uh, shed some light on how, how different everyone plays the game. Yeah. Yeah. And it, there's also the genius in knowing when to hold them and knowing when to fold them. There's times when you're like, I'm just not on the fish to win and I need to get as much points that you hear anglers. Like I fished the best I could for what I had on here. But I also think it's like the evilness of sports. You know what I mean? It's the success of an approach is always judged in the result. You know what I mean? Like if Jason Christie, sticks with his way of fishing and wins people are like wow what a genius you know he knew went through hours of them not biting that bait but he knew sooner or later they would but if they just don't bite that bait then it's like man why didn't he pick up something else why wouldn't he just i heard people like uh, at santee when he had those fish blowing up on the frog people are like why didn't christy pick something else up if he goes and catches the five right bites that day you're all what a genius, you know, what mental fortitude to get it done. So, which he had found in practice the day, but literally the afternoon of the last day of practice, he found that bike. Yeah. So what his thought was, if, if I can interpret it properly was if I just keep searching around, I'm going to run into that. And he had a little micro environment, you know, that he was relating to, but you know, either the timing was off, which as you know, timing can be everything. And in, yep. a, in a, an event like Pickwick with all the people on these community spots, you know, your rotation gets thrown off because you might go to, I mean, day two is a prime example. Jason went to, he, he'd go to six spots that he was counting on and there'd be someone sitting right on top of every single know, right, one every single one of them. So then all of a sudden he's like, okay, now what do I get? I got, I go do, you know, and you just start the rotation all over again and you end up spinning out. He didn't, but you know, you end up spinning out cause you can't find a spot. Yeah. Well, what, and one of the funny things about that is, and I don't know how much you see it because you stay on the angler's boat, but like when me and Overstreet were always on the water, um, at every single event, it would be funny. Cause an event like this, especially first few days of the tournament, when you're not keyed in on, with still, you're not as much keyed in on following one angler. On the first few days of the tournament, you're more keyed in on let's tell the story, what's happening out here, get as many guys as we can. So there'd be tournaments like the Pickwick tournament where we'd literally sit on one point and you would see people and they'd come around the corner and they'd be like, oh, there's a boat on it. Maybe they'd fish it. Maybe they wouldn't. But if that boat leaves and they just come around the corner, like boat could have left 13 seconds before. And they're like, oh, I got it all to myself. And you literally, there, there's times where you're like a quarter of the field has hit this spot today. And all these anglers think they're getting it to themselves. And the bizarre thing is the 18th boat to hit it is the one that cashes in on it. It's it's wild, but it's, yeah, it's rotation. Um, I hated it, Wayne. So rotation has become the, I didn't catch. It's not me that didn't catch him today. My rotation, rotation. was off. <laughs> Some people so you're with, just... When I actually showed up to the event by the weekend, uh, you were with Cody Huff, um, who is a very, very accomplished angler. He's an incredible angler, um, but this is his first top 10 in the Elite Series, and uh, I'm going to tell you, it won't be his last. What was your impression of your time with Cody? Confidence. Confidence is everything in this game, and he has confidence. Even, you know, one of the things I noticed uh, on at this event was – pro sharing space. And I'm talking about tight quarters. Yeah. Like he was uh, on day four late in the afternoon, Cody was catching big small mouth and they're jumping. Right. And literally Matt Robertson was parked 
15 yards at the most to our left. And they're sharing the space. They're talking back and forth, you know, giving, giving each other information and encouragement. And, and Huff is catching literally every cast, right? And this bottle rocket comes up out of the water and just launches and almost hits Matt Robertson's boat. That's how close he was. And I said, I said, to Matt, I said, so what happens if that fish jumps in your boat? And Matt Robertson goes, well, I guess he's going to have to come over here and fight me for it. <laughs> oh, I think Cody but, would whoop Matt Robertson. I mean, then he'd be like one in 42 or whatever his wrestling record is now. But, you know, running into other pros and watching the body language of the guy that you're with is a lot of there's 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 you know there's built in attitude there yeah. and the one thing that i really noticed about Cody Huff was his confidence at such a young age i mean he picked up when they weren't biting you know he was really waiting on the current and everything he caught before they started running current uh, at Pickwick was a bonus especially if they were good you know, three or four pounders. Right. And so he didn't have on, on the last day, he didn't, he had no weight at all. I mean, he, I think he might've had five fishing as well, but he may have had nine or 10 pounds. Right. So he packs up and he runs like 30 minutes down back towards uh, the dock. And he says, I'm going to go check a hole that I've been saving this entire tournament. I found these fish here during practice. I have not touched them. I've scanned them a few times on my way through, but I haven't touched them yet. So let's go see what's going on there. So we run literally, and this is like, it was noon. So time is ticking, right? Check-ins at three o'clock on championship Sunday. So he's got three hours. He runs 30 minutes one way to go check this spot. And we get there and there's fish all over it. But he, and he throws a crankbait in there and catches like four in a row. And they're all dinks. They're all, they're not even keepers at this point. They're not even legal keepers at this point. So we pack up again, turn around and go all the way back to his, his furthest point away from the, the, the dock to where he was really, where he caught him on day one, where he caught whatever it was, 21 or 22 pounds on day one mm -hmm. and pulls up and they just started running current. And it's like one thirty. we're 45 minutes plus all the, the boat traffic on Pickwick, th the rough waters we had to navigate through to get back. It's going to take you longer than, you know, a straight flat run back to, back to check-in. So he's accommodating for all this time to get back and he starts, he throws it, he, he, he puts a spoon down, put his crankbait down. He picks up a spinning rod and a three inch swim bait, right? And starts throwing it and boom, catches like a three pound smallmouth, puts it in the live well, throws a pound and a half out, throws it back in the water catches another four pound smallmouth, And all of a sudden he catches, he, I don't know that I've ever filmed anyone catch that many fish in a 30 minute period. Really? He caught almost 21 pounds in 30 minutes at the last minute of day four. So wow. literally I'm watching bass track, you know, I know what's going on and he's upgrading. And all of a sudden he went from being nine pounds back to four pounds back. And I'm going, dude, if he catches a seven, 12 or an eight pound fish, all of a sudden, like things the, the intensity of this is about to change. He never did, but he was really, really close to making a huge comeback, which may or may not be something that people really realize because we were almost off live and we were switching cameras at that point. They don't know that he caught 30 fish in 30 minutes or whatever it was. Yeah. You know? Yeah. It, it was, it, it was cool. I think people get lulled and people think, you know, me and Zona were joking about it in life, but I think I always get like Zona's like, oh, you're just trying to keep the excitement for the way in or whatever. And I'm like, no, dude, like I like, I mean, Lester's wife, you know, Kim was backstage with the kids and everything and she's all excited. I mean, everybody's telling her you're going to win. You know what I mean? But I, like I wouldn't hug her or anything. And afterwards, she obviously picked up on that beforehand because afterwards she came up and she's like, Will you give me a hug now or a real hug or whatever? Because I think I kind of just sidearmed her because I was just like, I don't want to jinx it because, yes, I believe there's a 99 percent chance he's going to win this tournament. But I also realized that there is a dude who could go catch 21 pounds in nine hours and that 21 pounds 
It ain't hard on that body of water for that 21 pounds to become 27. You know what I mean? Like, and just, I know it's just like that. So rare, but it could it happen. happen. And absolutely. Uh, and when you least expect it to happen, it happens, right? Yeah. <laughs> you <laughs> celebrate too early. Well, that's what I hate. Like I've heard from several pros that were like, I thought I'd lost. I didn't think I won the tournament, but I got to shore and people were like, you've won, you've won. Like there's media doing videos with them. Let's get the video out of the way. So I don't bug afterwards. And then all of a sudden it's like, doof, 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 you take a bunch of shots in the face. Somebody weighs in 27 pounds. And that exact same media that was around you telling you, you won is around a different person and you are kicking stones all by yourself. I mean, imagine what that feels like. All of a sudden, oh. you're just like, nobody wants to talk to me anymore. What just happened? <laughs> <laughs> what, like what? Literally, you're you're getting up off the canvas and you're going, yeah, I just get knocked out. <laughs> that's what it must feel like, really. You know what I mean? Like you're like everything. I mean, that's kind of what happened to Chris Johnston when he got beat by um Micah Frazier, you know, and media was telling him you've won and, and he didn't think he won when he came back in. But by the time he got all the way around there, he was like, and then Micah weighs in 25 or 26 pounds. And he's like, wait a second. But they all said I won. <laughs> and uh, I'm telling you, I was I was I was literally sitting on pins and needles filming Cody catching fish after fish after fish and. In a spot where. He could have easily caught. You've affected your mic with your drink. There you go. Thank you. Welcome. Sorry. Back. We got to keep a high he, standard here around the show. On a spot where he could have easily caught a seven or eight pounder in that kind of a school of fish that could have completely changed the 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 outcome. Yeah. Crazy. What a great yeah. sport. What a great sport. And and great to have. Like, I mean, I loved it at takeoff. You know, like, I hate how people in our sport are so scared. You know, that like it's almost like you can't say you're going to catch them because that'll be bad luck. And they don't, you know, they're so worried to, I mean, they'll trash talk each other off the microphone. Trust me, they are heartless. Like, if it, oh, yeah. But on a microphone, they all become bubble gum and they, you know, won't say anything. And I loved it how, like, nobody would say anything to Lester. I was trying to push them to, like, you know, he's got a four pound <laughs> lead going out on Sunday, have a little fun with the crowd that's here. And, uh, you know, I didn't expect it from Cody, but right away, like, and he looks right at Lester, like the way he did it was like, I'm like, this is beautiful. And he's like, <laughs> uh, all I'm going to say is, uh, I feel remarkably calm and you should be very scared. <laughs> and I was like, that is, that was awesome. perfect. <laughs> and he, that, I think that's how he really, that's really felt, yeah. how he felt. Yeah. And he feels that way on the lake. He never, I mean, Never once, even when they weren't biting, like he he'll sit down, crank his motor up, he'd get a sandwich out. He had like ham sandwiches with lettuce and tomatoes, like elaborate sandwiches, like hardly any of them eat, right? His wow. wife, his wife made they're wrapped up in aluminum foil. And he never once got rattled. He he is he has cold veins in his oh, yeah. body. Yeah. He is very calm angler, and that is going to take him a long way at this level of fishing. That's why I always post two X on his stuff, because from the day I've met him, I've called him two times as tough, Cody, uh, because I'm telling you, we like the first interview I ever did with him. We were at, I, forget, I think we we're in Texas. He had won the collegiate thing, and he was just coming to the event to do an interview. And I think that's when he got his boat and his truck and everything like that. And I've done interviews with all of them, you know, with every one of them that's come, you know, Jordan Lee included but as a college and they're all like deer in headlights. But the way he was so calm, it wasn't like he just dominated the microphone, but he was so calm. And there was like this polka band or something like that. It was so loud. It was throwing me off. And I just kept laughing. And he's like working his way through it. And then in, he is two X, man. He is two times as tough because he's like, he doesn't get rattled. He, uh, I, I think you'll see him on a lot of Sundays in the future. A hundred percent. How tough is he? Let's talk about the treble oh, hook and the calf. Yes. <laughs> Tell me about it. I mean, I, he still had blood on his, like dried blood on his leg when he came in for weigh-in. But you tell me, to, to, for those of you that didn't see him impale himself with a the very sharp giant. treble hook <laughs> yes. on a spoon. And so he catches, I don't know, it was probably a four-pounder. Four it was a nice fish. 
and he grabs it. He sits down on, you know, the, the deck, the front of the, or the back of the deck there closest to the steering column yeah. to unhook this fish. And he gets it too close to his body. The fish flops once and boom, I mean, like, like, a, like a hot knife in butter, this buries this treble hook in his leg. And I'm like, Ooh. Oh my goodness. He actually had two of the hooks on the same treble in his leg, but he was, he had the top one came out fairly easily. And so the fish is flopping around and he's trying not to drop the fish because then it's just, it's a mess. Yeah, right? yeah. You don't want to lose control of it. it if, even if it's going to flop, you got to stay yeah. close to the yeah. injury. Right. So finally the fish stops moving and he has to take his pliers and he has to, he has to, uh, through he has to uh, unhook the hook from to take the split ring off like the split disconnect ring. it from the actual di- exactly lure. there you go yeah disconnect the treble hook from the spoon then he has to get the spoon out of the fish's mouth right so all this is going on meanwhile i like zoom in i'm thinking okay this is TV drama. So I zoom in on the hook and I hear my producer, Anthony on the, or director on, on com going, uh, I don't know if we should show that right now. We should cut to another angle or something, <laughs> but then they let it play out. So I, I backed out a little bit and he had blood running down his leg. Like, a, like, like someone stuck a spear in his leg. Right. Um, oh. and so then we finally, he finally gets the fish in the live well, throws a spoon over the side on the rod, clears the area right now he's going okay now what do i do so he reaches into he didn't have a a rod out with any braided line on it so he reaches into his rod locker pulls a a rod out cuts the lure off cuts a long section or a short section of braided line starts tying his knots and then i asked him i said i think this is one of those situations where i can help you if you need my help let me know. And he said, let me, let me just see what happens. So he ties his knots. He tied he, the knot to the hook. Yeah. He, he, okay. Yeah. Around, around the, the bend in the hook. Right. So he jerks once and it doesn't come out and I could just see his calf moving like, like, oh, twitching. Cold je- like jello. I was like, Oh my God. So then he jerks again and it doesn't come out. And I'm going at this point, I just had to turn my head and hold the camera still, uh, while he's doing all this. And he finally gets it out with the third jerk and there's a piece of meat left on his hook. Oh yeah. (laughs) Oh no, that's horrible. Oh, that's horrible. I've never seen that for Well, I mean, Oh Yeah. That's bad. So then he puts the same, there's blood all over the spoon. He puts the same hook back on the spoon, gets up and starts fishing with it again. Where'd the chunk of flesh go? <laughs> Did he like rip it he, off with pliers? Yeah, he flicked. He, uh, yeah, look. Yeah. He, no, he, no, he took it off with his hands and he just flicked it in the water. <laughs> <laughs> he shaded on the way down. <laughs> oh man. That was a, that was a, that was a pretty bad one. I've seen, I've seen some hooks in people, but that was probably the worst one yet. Yeah, I see. That's why I asked if he tied it because I don't tie it. I've done nine Elite Series pros. I've ripped hooks out of in my tenure just because you're on the water. You know what I mean? And and most times when people when it happens and somebody says, you know, they look around for somebody they know and I'm somebody they know. And, and there's a lot of somebody, you know, that are not willing to do it. But I mean, I've done it a bunch of times, but I never tie it because I always find like that's when it can jam up. You know what I mean? Like you're. You want it loose almost so that it, it slides pulls the direction your the exact direction like it doesn't it stops you the, at the you need all that stops, momentum yeah to go right, that it way it stops where the where the metal would allow you to stop when you jerk it yeah yeah but um I, I'm not saying he did it wrong but I was just I've seen there is people that tie it um, but it it uh, it's uh, it's <laughs> it, 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 doing it yourself has got to be incredibly hard. Oh my goodness. I can't imagine. I had to pull a hook out of Lee's hand one time with pliers. He didn't want to, he didn't want to take the time. He he just, he just said, I said, what do you want me to do, man? I was more nervous than he was. He goes, just pull it out, man. And so I just pulled it out and he never flinched nothing. (laughs) I, yeah, the plier thing I don't get. Like, so I've seen Saw Grigsby do that. That was the the original dude I saw do that. It's like, it's less of a yank and it's more of a like, you full power and you just, 
Uh, I, no, I don't. I mean, to me, it just seems, but I mean, it also shows, you know, like they got to get that hook out and uh, get, get back, back to, fishing. to fishing, I guess. Hey, man, when I was a kid, I never tied a string to a tooth and slammed the door. I always let my tooth fall out naturally. <laughs> you know what I, I like did? Pain. <laughs> Bananas. When I was a kid, I figured this out and I, and I, it passed on to my children. Because, I mean, I was money grubbing kid. I wanted you know, as soon as it wiggled a little bit, I'm like, somebody help me get this out. I had 50 cents on the line. But if you eat a banana because a banana is like, you know, when you eat, it, it's got like suction. Uh -huh. So if it gets loose enough and your kids have a loose tooth, I me a banana. But they just got to feel through the banana each bite because it, before you know it, it's going to suck out. It. And it's going to be in the banana. And then but you get your 50 cents or five dollars. Huh. How much is the tooth fairy nowadays? Jay? Dude, inflation is like 10 bucks now, dude. Gosh, I yeah. would have eaten nothing but bananas growing and up. The expectation is there. Well, my friend got $10 for her tooth. Well, okay. she has nicer teeth. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry to break it to you. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, $10. That's expensive. I mean, inflation. Kids Inflation's yeah. everywhere. <laughs> I got gotcha. you. I got gotcha. you. Another cool thing at the event, Bill Dance was there. And that honestly was one of, um, I was excited when I knew he was coming. Um, but even, you know, every time you spend with that dude, you're like, just like, wow, this guy is, I mean, he's 82 years old. He just, the stories that he has and the energy that he shows up with is, is incredible. Um, and you know, the coolest thing is while I'm interviewing him, um, and it, even cooler, like I didn't know who would do the interview, but they asked me to do the interview, which was awesome and even bigger honor. Um, and, uh, while I'm interviewing him, he's like, you know, we got on to bass, you know, we, we talked about the, the cool program that Texas or Tennessee is doing. Uh, they're putting $15 million into making build and signature lakes, basically making the lakes better. And Pickwick's one of the lakes that they're investing a bunch of money in. And, um, but he's like this, so we got talking about bass and he's like, without bass, there is no build dance. You know what I mean? Like that started my career. He met Ray Scott right in that parking lot. Like right where we were. Wow. He's like right here. And as he's telling me the story, I swear to you, the hair on the back of my neck stands up. Like, I'm like, what? what? And he's like, must yeah, have been right like over that hill there. He said, I met him. I, I didn't ask him what year it was, but yeah, had to be right in there. And, um, and Ray Scott had already reached out to him. Like he knew who he was, but Ray Scott, like to get all the initial people in the best events, he trash talked them all. Really? He was the original sent letters. And he's like, well, the guys in Oklahoma say you have no shot <laughs> or whatever, but we hear you're a hot shot in Tennessee. So, um, Genius. so they got talking and, um, and Bill Dance is like, we, you know, we decided to have breakfast together that morning. We had breakfast, Bill Dance, the restaurant was closed. Bill Dance ended up cooking breakfast that morning because he had some experience cooking. So he went behind like the grill. And then he said that there was bass club. There was a bass club or something there. That's why Ray was there. Well, they came in and he ended up cooking 34 breakfasts before he got to sit down because they didn't know who Bill Dance was. He's just the guy who was cooking behind there. Um, but he, he it's just he's Bill Dance. It's it's amazing. Like there's there's part of me that doesn't understand why he's still doing this. You know what I mean? But it's it's who he is like. It's thank God he's still doing it. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I mean, really. But, but you know what I mean? Like you do look at him and you're like, you're 82, like you should retire. But, but I think this is also what keeps him young. Like I think if Bill Dance just sat around and told stories, he would like, he's always on the go. And um, it was a career highlight for me to spend a little time with, I, you know, spent time with Bill, but never done anything together on camera. So it was, uh, it was very, very cool for me. When it came, when I heard you on calm, I heard the interview going, I was thinking about you and how I prob I thought that was probably that has to be a, a, a career highlight to be with an iconic figure like that. And 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 I was I was proud for you that that was happening, even though I couldn't see it. I could hear it. And I, I thought it was really cool. And as a kid. So uh, I think I've told you this story before. You know, when I was at, even actually when the year I was born, um, my dad was the president of the chamber of commerce yeah. in Benton County on Kentucky Lake. And Ray Scott came to him because they wanted to bring BASS to Kentucky Lake. They had never been there before. And 
So my dad helped him, you know, raise money. They helped fund it. They got hotel rooms or whatever they did to help them facilitate the event. And I believe Bobby Murray won that event, but an 18 year old Bill Dance came in second. I believe it was something like that. And so as a kid, I'd heard Bill Dance's name a lot from at a very young age and growing up a Tennessee fan, the university of Tennessee fan, I was me and all the people in Tennessee were always so proud that Bill Dance was this iconic figure in the bass fishing world. And he wore the Tennessee hat. That was like yeah. our thing. That was like, he was our King. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's pretty, it's pretty cool. He, he is a King. I mean, I kept saying in the interview, I opened the interview and I closed it with that. I'm like, if there was a Mount Rushmore for our sport, this man, like there's couldn't be argued who'd be on it, but Bill Dance is definitely one of them. And Ray Scott's 100%. another, you know what I mean? And it's, it's just um, amazing what he's done for the sport, you know, and, and, you know, people forget, like, you know, people like to talk about like his private lakes and all this. And I mean, dude won three angler of the years qualified for seven class, eight classics and won seven events and didn't do it for that long. You know what I mean? It's, it's uh so Bill Dance, uh, thank you. That was cool. And all I wanted to do during the interview, when he started with that, it, I just hated that we were on FS1 because when, when we're on FS1, which is awesome, I do not edit this to say I hate being on FS1. I love <laughs> being on FS1. But everything's fit busier. Everything's faster, you know, because you got set commercial breaks and everything. So you just can't take the time that you want. And as soon as he started telling me about, you know, this is where I met Ray, I, all I'm like in my back of my head, I'm like, Oh, I have so many follow-up questions and everything. So stay tuned. You might see Bill Dance here in the future. Who knows? Maybe working I mean, the, on it. Big deal the, coming together. The Tennessee river, you know, it's just a, the whole thing has just played a, a huge role yeah. in, in the whole growth of in and empowerment of bass fishing i always of course it's home for me growing up on kentucky lake and i fished a lot uh at pickwick when i was a kid too particularly for sauger and smallmouth because we really didn't have smallmouth in kentucky lake when i was a kid so we would go to pickwick to catch smallmouth yeah. and you know it's it's always home for me and it's always good to go back to the tennessee river i hope we always have events on the tennessee river every year I think we, I think we, I mean, I think we'll be the back classic. there for sure. Big, I, I don't know what classic, but I just with the amount that the folks from Tennessee told me that, that like behind our stage there, they're putting in 250 slips so that in a tournament, they can all pull up to their own slips right there and everything. So I'm sure they'll wow. want us back there in the future and Bass will want to be back there in the future. Um, another thing I found out about Bill Dance while I was there, and I don't know if this is public knowledge or not, um, but I feel like it should be one of the coolest things <laughs> it's is about people, to be. It's about to be um, <laughs> one of the coolest things about what Bill Dance is doing with those signature lakes and everything. And just one of the things you think of with Bill Dance is, well, of course, he's doing that because he's a businessman and Bill Dance has put his name on everything. You know what I mean? From the dance and eel to whatever today and made lots of money. Bill Dance is getting paid zero dollars and zero cents to do this. Like what he's doing with the state of Tennessee, if you really dig into it, is an immense project, an immense amount of time, but it is 100% a legacy program for him. He is giving not back. doing that. Yeah, it's his way of giving back. And uh, he's doing it for my kids. He's doing yeah. it for the kid. He's doing it for the future generations so that this never goes away, particularly on, you know, in on the Tennessee River where, you know, he made his mark. Yeah, I mean, it, it's yeah. cool. I mean, you look at what Texas has done with their lakes and you take that business model and you translate that over into, into you know, Tennessee and the Tennessee River system and all those lakes. I mean, that's going to leave its mark for a very, very long time. And you think about what like the, all the lakes on the Tennessee River, they're all they're constantly like they're almost like. It's not like these lakes compete against each other. Yeah. Kentucky Lake goes downhill. Pickwick goes up. Gunnersville goes up. You know, Chickamauga goes down or whatever it is. And these, these lakes are constantly moving up and down. But the fact of the matter is there's always two lakes on that system that are in an up cycle in, in their, in their, in their, in their, in their, you know, bass in their, uh, 
uh, quality bass management yeah. uh, programs. And so, um, what, what he's doing is, is really cool for the future of, of bass fishing. Yeah. Yeah. And it, I mean, several anglers did talk on stage that they were concerned about the carp and stuff that are getting in there now. So um, it's not all rainbows and, and butterflies, but, but part of what that money is going to do is to help some of that as well. Um, and I also thought like, I mean, how cool is that? Like you think about it, like Bill dance, if you look at, what he's doing with those lakes. And then you look at um, the Luke Bryant song that came out last year about him. Like, like there's people that are going to know that name and who Bill Dance is that never watched Bill Dance. You know what I mean? Like it, it's almost like, like Virgil Ward, for example, was a famous fishing show host that was before both of our times. And we hear about his voice and we hear about his name, but really, I don't know anything other than his name just because it was before our time or very little. Bill Dance is, I mean, he's going to become a freaking folk hero. Like, uh, that's why I said to him, I said, what does it feel like to have a song, like a hit song written about you? And he's like, what? It was a good year to be Bill Dance, he said. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, how many times has he mentioned in, in country music songs? Yeah, because our Luke Combs song I just was listening to a little while ago has Bill Dance mentioned in it again. Spread the love, country music folk. I mean, uh, <laughs> some other fishermen out there. Um, who else needs to be mentioned in songs? Lee Livesey. I mean, Whiskey <laughs> Myers has to give Lee Livesey a song. Hey, man, song when Frogman, when they played Frogman last night, that's all I could think of was Lee and Chickamauga. <laughs> oh, I keep telling them. I'm like, you need to be the first person ever to weigh into with the actual band playing the song while you come in <laughs> on the front deck of your boat. It would be freaking awesome. That, um, that reminds me of a movie called I'm going to get you sucker. Have you ever seen that? Yes, I've seen that. Oh my, And when he talks about every superhero should have a theme song and he's got a band playing behind him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's Lee Livesey with Whiskey Myers. Yeah. And I think they could add stuff in like when he says stuff like like it's not just they won't just play Frogman in the way in like while he's talking. Like they can put wah, 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 like different <laughs> different things like <laughs> dun, 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 to suspenseful things that he says or whatever. That's what goes through my mind. What else we got, Jake? Is that it? I mean, I was going to ask you who you got, who you got for, for the St. Lawrence river. We're about, I'm, I'm happy to go North. It's been hot in the South. I'm ready to go yeah. North. Yeah. Um, Ooh. I'm picking Corey. Uh, I, that's the, that's the pick. I mean, that's where everyone's going to be looking. Um, Corey and Chris are going to be the odds on favorite going into that event. Um, every single time we go there, but what they've done on that body of water is incredible, but I think it's going to be really interesting to see because I feel like every time we go there, their advantage gets less. I and agree. And more and more people go out to the lake and we're going to be closer to the lake than we've ever been. Um, other than the, the one year when Chris won it, ironically. Um, right. <laughs> so I think that, um, I think that those guys are definitely the odds on favorite, but I, I feel like there's plenty of dudes like, Hey man, Clark Wendlet has spent an incredible amount of time out there and he's been in the top 10 a lot of times these last few times. I think Justin Atkins has also cracked that nut. I think, you know, he finished second there and he was in the top three in the open in the fall that Corey won. Um, so he's kind of figured out the drill out there. And I think there'll be, you know, to talk me, obviously. Yeah. You got to throw um, Taku in there. Yeah. But, but I think that there's the, I think that every time we go there, their advantage gets less, but their advantage is still their advantage. I mean, Canadian water is going to be open, which will we'll play. Here's the other thing that I found out, though, that, that will be exciting for some and not for others. There's supposed to be a poker run. I cannot confirm this, but I will at some point. I'll just throw it out there because I've been told by multiple people that is in Clayton the exact same week that we're there. So um, gas sales are going to be through the roof in Clayton. Whoa. Congratulations to all gas station owners. <laughs> um, the, there'll be a lot of girls in bikinis and the Johnston brothers. I mean, what else do you need to have a good wow. time? I'm in. Um, I mean, I'm fully in. <laughs> yeah. And Hey, Canada, this is the closest and elite series event is ever going to get to you. It's hard enough for those of you that keep telling me we need to have an elite series event. 
in Canada, that'd be wonderful. But it's hard enough for me to get down there for you to ever expect them to get all of these anglers and all the service crews and everything over the border. It, it ain't not happening. Right now. Not anytime soon. No. Um, I'm trying to get Jake to come to my house for three days, and that's <laughs> not easy. Um, so it's going to be close and it's closer than ever before. Like I love Waddington, but this is 45 minutes closer for the folks that are from the part of Ontario that I'm from. The Johnsons are from closer to Toronto. Get on over there. Let's invade this event and, uh, and turn it into a party. Cause Carl Jacobson was talking about the Australians. And if he makes the classic, there'll be shoeys and stuff. Kenda, there's other nations trying to take over drinking and bass fishing. Remind them. That yes, in Canada, fit drinking is an Olympic sport. <laughs> Come to the event. What week is that? Talk amongst yourselves while I look it up here right now. I'll tell you what week it is. It is. I'm picking Corey while you're looking. While you're looking it up, I'm picking Corey. Even with all the all the challenges that come with more and more people getting tuned in to Lake yeah. Ontario and the St. Lawrence system. I'm picking Corey solely based on a his competitive nature, in in relation to the frustrations he's had up there coming in second or third in the top five, and really, 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 really wanting to win that St. Lawrence Elite yeah. event, particularly after having won that Open last year. I, I, we actually covered that, and he was so pumped. Like, you know, it was a smaller crowd. It was a smaller event, so to speak. And, but you could see it when I went up to, uh, you know, give him a high five after he won, you could just see how pumped he was to win that event. So I'm picking Corey Johnston to win this year's St. Lawrence river elite event. I would love to see that happen just, for nobody too. more than Corey. Cause Me too. good Lord. I mean, he needs to shed the only Canadian to never to <laughs> win an elite series event. Um, and I think, he, dude, he's been so close so many times in the past. But that event is July 14th, 15th, 16th, and 17th. Book your rooms now. There will be a party in town. There may or may not be a poker run. But I think that'll actually help in some ways because I believe the poker run, like last time we were there when there was a poker run, we were in Waddington. So all of the boats that were heading out to the mouth or to the lake had to run through it. I believe the poker run runs up the river. So maybe it uh, the majority of our field, I would imagine, will fish the lake this time. As a camera guy who's going to have to bounce around the boat, what do you think when I say poker run? <laughs> I think boat traffic. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think a, a, a hella ride back. I think, but but you know, Lake Ontario, man, you just those guys spot locked over a spot out there just beats you to death if it's. You know, if the winds, if the winds ride out there, man, it can get really, remember that, uh, was it two years ago when Paul Mueller and, uh, yeah. I mean, that was a beat down. Those were, those were huge swells and that was a beat down. I'm trying to run this. I'm, I'm, I'm look at how smart I am. I'm literally looking up Clayton, New York poker run to find out if, if I'm giving right or wrong information here. Well, it turns out that there is a poker run <laughs> that wow. very weekend. Um, wow. Yeah. Yeah, it's going to be a good one by the looks of things. They are excited about it. These boats are ridiculously large, and I don't oh think goodness. anybody cares how much the gas is. <laughs> They're going, but it says, yeah, it's that weekend. Uh, where's the, is it every day? Um, yep. Yeah, event dates. Starts Thursday, July 14th to in Saturday, Clayton? July 16th in Clayton, New York. Wow. So, yeah, Sunday, Sunday. I'm going to bring, we're down my, to I'll 10 bring my mouthpiece. <laughs> you better. I have, I have a mouthpiece for days like that. Really? You put it in, chomp down, and oh, smart. Yeah. Yeah. Smart. Smart. Yeah. You don't keep those pearly whites so nice without <laughs> that. Um, yeah, so there's there's definitely a poker run. It's not something I'm making up, but it does. it's for make-a-wish, so. Um, you'll have to make a wish I will at be certain a times wish. throughout yeah. the day. What at do you got ahead of you? I mean, I got to shoot some shows and um, do all sorts of stuff like that. What do you got ahead of you before that event? Yeah, so we've got like a five week off season here yeah. between events, and I'm gonna I'm going to get caught up on some pretty big video edits that I have to finalize, and then I'm gonna spend a lot of time with my children. And particularly spend a lot of time fishing with my son. Yeah. It's, he's, it's on he's, one of my, 
loving the big baits, isn't he? He's he's he a swim bait he, master. He he's 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 catching on really really fast. And there's a a kid here um, uh, who, who lives in my neighborhood who loves bass fishing. He's 14 years old. He's a huge bass master man. He's actually really really good at it. He qualified for junior nationals last year and couldn't make it to Tennessee because he got COVID. But he's out. We fish all It'll the happen. time together. I know. <laughs> and uh, we fish all the time together and he's out fishing one of the lakes, our local lakes here. And he's already caught four bass. I've been looking at my text messages. He caught four bass over four pounds today already. So he's on. Wow. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Nice. So lots of fishing. <laughs> all right. Yep, lots of fishing. All right. Well, maybe we'll have you back on here. And I don't mean that like maybe if you're lucky, I mean that like hopefully we can figure out because yeah. I'm trying to shoot a bunch of them today, to be honest, just so I can go fishing a lot. Um, Cause I made this weird commitment to the fine viewers of this show that we will be here every single Wednesday. And it turns out when you're shooting television shows, that's hard. So um, <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to hammer through a few of them today, uh, but I, but I'd love to have you back on. Maybe we'll talk about like what happens when you go to 64 different grateful dead concerts. Like, I mean, you, you have, that is two months worth of your life you have spent at a Grateful Dead concert. And I had I mean, so much fun. I wouldn't, I wouldn't trade that for anything. <laughs> I bet. <laughs> it was, it was more about, I mean, you know, there's a culture there and I was, I was just having fun hanging with friends and it's kind of like, we, we'll talk about this on another podcast, but I'll, I'll, I'll uh, uh, preface this. It's kind of like Bassmaster where you go to a show and there's weeks between shows. You go to another show and you see people you haven't seen in a month. And then during the off season, it starts all over again. And you see, it's like, it's a, it's a, it's a group of, it's like a cult. Yeah, it's, it's a, a group of people that you get to see on the road that you never see otherwise. So it's pretty cool. I feel like there's some of our Bassmaster family that was just insulted that you compared them to a Grateful Dead. I feel like the <laughs> greetings a little, whoa, bro. <laughs> I feel like it's a little What's different that? at a Grateful Dead. It's a, <laughs> I mean, it's loving at a Bassmaster, but not, I don't know. I don't know. I like Cherry Garcia ice cream. Check it out. <laughs> Grateful <laughs> Dead concerts are fun. Jake, it's always good to uh, catch up with you. Um, and I, I appreciate you doing this on your sleep-deprived Whiskey Myers. Uh, well, I don't know. Still high on Whiskey Myers vibe. I look forward to it every Tuesday after an event, and it's it's definitely uh, something I'm I'm glad to be able to chat with you, and and uh, it's a lot of fun. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah, and with that in mind, just so you know, let's start. I want to say this, and you might not like this, but dude, this is you've become one of my favorite people to talk to on this podcast, just because we have real conversations, and I I look forward to it too. But I also Kudos to the viewers of this show, because to be honest, before we did this, we talked about it for a long time before we did it. And it's quite often that you will tune in. Like if it's not an elite series pro on the show, you see the numbers like we're going to go tanking just because people are fans of them and they want to. But man, the, I think the viewers of this show are just so much more advanced in the way that they, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like the, uh -huh. the, they dig just the real like, but they're tuned into it. There's no doubt. It they listen to everything. Yeah, I agree. Thanks for giving my buddy that's a camera guy a shot. And <laughs> thank now you, you, people. You like him more than me. So, well, <laughs> well I, before you go, I will say this, though. The legacy I left behind with the shit show lives on oh. because I can't. I'm telling you, people just come up and t tell me that how hard they laughed after during during and after that show. So. I'm glad we did it. <laughs> Thank you for letting me tell my story, Dave. Yeah. I'm, I like that you were open about <laughs> If you haven't listened to the shit show, uh, check it. I'll leave the link in the, uh, in the description. There'll be a link to the shit show. Um, it's very popular. It's very popular. It's huge in Japan. I hear it is. Yeah. It is. <laughs> <laughs> and so are you. This has been. Our Pickwick review, the ultimate Jake's take. And as always, Uncle Bob, take it away. Thanks for watching. Please like, comment, and subscribe. Because Bob Cobb of the Bassmasters told you to. You hear? <laughs>